Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk general aviation with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. I'm a full-time flight instructor and the author of several books on the Garmin G1000, 3000, 5000, and Perspective, and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. Today, we answer a number of listener questions about IFR pop-up requests for practice instrument approaches, such as where do you find the right frequencies to call on, what should you say, what should you say on the CTAF when going into a non-tired airport, and under what conditions can you legally log an instrument approach for currency purposes, and more. Last week in episode 236, we talked about what you need to do to use GPS to fly the final segment of a VOR approach, plus more on VOR plus V approaches and some autopilot gotchas. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 236. And this is a listener-supported show, which means, yes, we're ad-free. But think about what it's worth to you if you were to learn just one thing that could someday save your life. And then sign up to become a member to help support this show. Just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, and when you do, I'll read your name on the show. This week in the news, an abandoned 747 is up for sale if you'd like to bid on it. One airline is offering triple pay to pilots who pick up trips in July. And a CFI and a student survived a crash landing, only to be robbed as they were waiting for police to arrive. And we'll tell you where that happened. All this and more, and the news starts now. From AviationPros.com, abandoned 747 parked outside the Evergreen Air Museum in Oregon to be sold at auction. A derelict 747 that's been parked in front of the Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum for about eight years goes on the auction block on July 25th. McMinnville Properties, a company controlled by wine entrepreneur Bill Stoller, who also owns the museum, hopes to gain control of the plane. It filed suit last year against a Kansas City-based aircraft parts and leasing operation called Jet Midwest, which bought the 747 in 2014 after Evergreen International filed bankruptcy. The plane and the museum are legacies of the Evergreen Company and its colorful founder, Del Smith. Evergreen assembled a large fleet of aircraft and became a significant local employer as it grew to become a major aviation contractor for the federal government and other customers. The museum is best known as the home of the Spruce Goose, that enormous aircraft designed and flown just once by Howard Hughes. Stoller injected a dose of stability into the operation when one of his companies bought part of the museum in 2020. It has since acquired all five buildings at the site, said Wayne Marshall, vice president of the Stoller Group. McMinnville Properties last year sued Jet Midwest and two other companies, seeking immediate payment of more than $587,000 in storage fees, interest, and other charges. McMinnville Properties hopes to prevail at the foreclosure sale, Marshall said. And if they gain ownership of the jet, what then? Well, Marshall isn't sure. It has no engines, so flying it off into the sunset isn't an option. There's a possibility the 747 could remain in place. The plane has been parked for so long in front of the museum, it's become a bit of a landmark, according to Marshall. From businessinsurance.com, aviation insurance premiums do increase by up to 5% per year. Despite recent challenges, the outlook for the aviation insurance industry looks promising, with an estimated premium growth of 4 to 5% per year through 2030, according to a new report by Swiss RE Institute. In addition to this, with airlines' investment in greener and safer new aircraft, the Institute sees growing opportunities for the market. Combining cargo and passenger traffic, the commercial aircraft fleet is forecast to rise from around 25,000 airplanes in 2019 to close to double that number in 2040. That corresponds to a compound annual growth rate of about 3.1%. More airplanes flying means a larger premium opportunity for insurers. The Institute estimates global nominal gross written premiums in aviation and space insurance could grow by 4 to 5% annually on average to 2030 in nominal terms. Another long-term tailwind for insurers is the uninterrupted historical downward trend in air travel accidents, which is likely to continue and to reduce the frequency of claims. However, claim severity has gone in the opposite direction as aircraft become increasingly valuable due to growing complexity in their design and manufacturing process and with inflation. And here's another insurance-related story. This comes from avweb.com. They call it death of an airplane. Although insurance is surely a nice thing to have, no one wants to suffer through the trauma of losing an airplane and cashing the check. But Rich Wellner recently did. A security camera caught the destruction of his mall in a severe thunderstorm a few weeks ago. A tie-down rope parted, and the airplane was upended at Schaumburg, Illinois. Wellner said his takeaways are, number one, park against the prevailing wind. 
Number two, there is no number two, he said. I was four miles away under partly cloudy skies, and I had no idea that the weather was breaking bad so close by. Could spoilers have helped? Maybe. Could other ropes have helped? Maybe. Could I have moved the plane? If I had, it would have been north to Wisconsin, where it would have been hit by a different line of weather, so who knows if that would have helped. The only thing that I could possibly adopt as a reasonable practice is to point away from prevailing winds and hope the backside of the storm doesn't get me anyway. From AOPA.org, training and safety tip, empty a seat for high heat. Why does your rental policy limit the airplane to three people? That's a summertime policy at several flight schools in the high and hot regions of the western U.S. On a hot day, the issue is not about gross weight limitations. It's about the degradation of performance due to density altitude. Utah's Provo Airport has a field elevation of approximately 4,500 feet MSL, and on an August day, the density altitude can be close to 9,000 feet MSL. Small airplanes typically have a published service ceiling of 12,000 to 15,000 feet, and most pilot operating handbooks do not provide takeoff calculations at pressure altitudes above 8,000 feet. But takeoff performance is not the only concern. Pay attention to terrain and environment and factor in the need to clear hills and mountain ridges, fly out of mountain valleys, and be prepared for attention getting downdrafts. Also remember that if a landing does not go according to plan, a go around with gear and flaps extended over the runway and climb performance compromised by high density altitude can become challenging. The lesson, during the summer heat, when performance is decreased by density altitude, compensate by flying with less weight. A few years ago, despite the airplane rental company's policy that limited occupancy to three people in a four-seat Piper Aero, a renter pilot put a fourth person in the airplane that was fully loaded with fuel. After a short flight, the pilot returned to the airport and initiated a go-around after a ballooned landing. The airplane stalled in the go-around effort, resulting in a hard landing, and it careened off the edge of the runway. Crossing a ditch, the main gear was torn off, and the aft fuselage was heavily damaged. Fortunately, no one was injured. This example just reinforces the need to educate pilots about the reality of density altitude. And if you'd like to learn more about mountain flying and leaning for high density altitude, check out episodes 196 and 197 of Aviation News Talk. From CNBC.com, American Airlines Regional Carrier offers pilots triple pay to pick up trips in July. American Airlines Regional Carrier Envoy Air is offering pilots triple pay to pick up trips for most of next month, an effort the airline says will help it avoid flight disruptions during the peak summer travel season. Supercritical coverage has been declared for July 2nd to 31st for all bases, according to a note sent to Envoy pilots on Monday that was seen by CNBC. Any open time flown during this time frame will be paid at 300%. Thank you in advance for your help, said the note. Rick Wilson, VP of Flight Operations for Envoy, said, We are into our peak flying season, and we want to ensure that we can operate dependably for our customers. The airline said in a statement that it has had an extraordinary completion factor for the month of June, referring to completed flights. As part of the proactive strategy to run a reliable schedule during the peak summer travel season, Envoy is offering pilots triple pay to pick up uncovered trips on their days off in the month of July, the carrier said. This will only be offered if there are open trips available, and currently Envoy is fully covered with its flight schedule this summer. The approaching 4th of July holiday weekend will be a test for airlines that have struggled to tamp down delays amid staffing shortages. And from generalaviationnews.com, distracted pilot forgets to remove pitot tube cover. And this comes from a NASA ASRS report written by the pilot. He wrote, During pre-flight, distraction led to failure to remove pitot tube cover. Upon takeoff roll, noticed airspeed indicator not showing airspeed. Approximately halfway down the runway, aborted takeoff. After hard braking, realized that the runway would be overshot. The Cirrus SR-22 stopped approximately 10 feet past the end of the runway. No runway lights were hit. No damage occurred to either the plane or runway lighting. Informed tower what transpired. Taxi to terminal ramp. Upon inspection, removed pitot tube cover. Informed tower and was given permission to taxi to active runway. Completed the flight without other incident. And also from generalaviationnews.com, VFR into IMC leads to crash for student pilot. The student pilot and his passenger, yeah, there's a problem, departed on a VFR flight rules cross-country flight in the Beach 77 and entered instrument meteorological conditions. So just to recap, we have a student pilot carrying a passenger who flew into a cloud. So that's two violations there. He decided to continue climbing, and when the airplane exited the clouds, he saw the top of a mountain and trees directly in front of him. 
He stalled the airplane to reduce speed, and the airplane hit trees at a speed of about 60 knots before it descended to the ground near Elizabethton, Tennessee. The airplane sustained substantial damage to both wings, but the student pilot and the passenger were uninjured. The student pilot told investigators that he made a mistake and took full responsibility for the accident. And just to be clear, he didn't just make a mistake. He willfully violated the FARs. Probable cause, according to the NTSB, the student pilot's decision to continue from visual flight into instrument meteorological conditions, which resulted in a collision with trees in mountainous terrain. So, hey, let's be careful out there. And also from GeneralAviationNews.com, GA pilots drill in preparation of the big one. A June 18th test of how GA could help in the aftermath of a devastating earthquake in the Pacific Northwest proved successful. Called Thunder Run, the day-long drill was truly a major step forward for GA and the West Coast General Aviation Response Plan, and a huge success in very inclement weather, reported Sky Terry, Northwest Regional Emergency Services Director for the Emergency Volunteer Air Corps. It's been over a decade in the making, but we've truly built a response network that will be there in our darkest hour to make that life-saving difference, he said, noting the annual drills have been held for the past 11 years. He explained that while GA is willing to step up in an emergency, it's important to train for such events. To make the event even better, the drill included GA pilots flying food to food banks around the region. During the drill, 57 GA pilots from Washington, Oregon, and Canada flew food to multiple food banks in Washington and Oregon, Terry said. From AOPA.org, Piper plucks apprentices from high school. Say that three times fast. GA manufacturer giant Piper Aircraft made several hires after hosting high school students at its Vero Beach, Florida headquarters. On May 5th, students from Vero Beach High School and Sebastian River High School were invited for a tour and exploratory visit of the Piper Aircraft Worldwide headquarters. After the tour, Piper conducted interviews with the soon-to-be graduates and then extended job offers to 84% of the candidates. In early June, Piper announced that the new hires were currently in the training process and will join the manufacturing and production control teams in the near future. With the robust nature of the marketplace and demand for both trainer and personal aircraft, Piper's production for 2022 is sold out with firm orders into 2024, Piper said. The aviation industry is quickly rebounding after the pandemic, with organizations across the industry seeing an increase in shipping and sales. Manufacturers like Piper are not only battling supply chain delays, but also worker shortages, and they are eager to expand the workforce. To meet current and future production needs, Piper continues to actively recruit aircraft maintenance technicians, operators, assemblers, and more. For more information about career opportunities at Piper Aircraft, visit their website. From Fox8.com, woman charged with using stolen IDs to steal plane crashed during takeoff at local airport. Now, oddly, this is the second story in two weeks we've covered about Medina, Ohio. You may recall last week that a teen had organized what appeared to be drag races at the Medina airport. This week, a woman was indicted and arrested in Medina County for stealing someone else's identity to steal a small plane. According to court records, she stole an elderly person's ID and insurance to steal a plane. Investigators say she crashed during takeoff, and an insurance investigation led to a criminal case. Medina County Prosecutor Forrest Thompson said a grand jury indicted Karina Gaynatanova. She now faces charges for identity fraud, insurance fraud, and unauthorized use of a vehicle. The case began last August at Sky Park Airport in Wadsworth. Sheriff's deputies say Gaynatanova rented a Cessna 150, but she crashed during takeoff and did $30,000 of damage. Later, an insurance company found her insurance had expired. Investigators say they determined Gaynat Denova, who has a commercial pilot certificate and a flight attendant certificate, had used someone else's ID and insurance in order to be able to rent the plane. The grand jury indicted her in May, and authorities arrested her last week. Her LinkedIn profile says that she's currently a full-time flight attendant working for Delta Airlines, is based in the Los Angeles area, and that she speaks Russian. The FAA is also investigating. And finally, from capetalk.co.za, pilot and student robbed while calling for help after Crosswords plane crash. The pilot of an aircraft that came down in lower crossroads in Cape Town, South Africa earlier this week told emergency crews he and his passenger were being robbed while they waited for help. The light aircraft from a local flying school suffered engine failure just before 6 p.m. While radioing for help, the pilot and his student reported that eyewitnesses had begun looting the plane. City of Cape Town EMS spokesperson Eckert Winks told News 24, a crowd quickly gathered around the plane. The pilot radioed air traffic, calling for urgent assistance, complaining that they were being robbed of their personal belongings and the aircraft looted. 
Both of the occupants of the plane were later taken to the hospital suffering minor injuries. And I looked at the photo and it shows an aircraft registration number that matches up with a Piper PA-28-180 Cherokee that's in the past been based at Eagle Air Flight School in Pretoria, South Africa. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up next, a few of my updates, and then all about pop-up requests for IFR and practice instrument approaches, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And let's go to the good news department. First up, Patreon supporter Michael Rose. He says, hi, Max. I just passed my instrument check ride in my Cirrus SR-22. Congratulations to you, Michael. He says, I have to give substantial credit to the podcast for helping prepare me. Your podcasts are full of excellent, relevant information, and it definitely helped. I've been going back to older episodes that have IFR topics, and I'm appreciating their relevance even more than when I previously listened to them with the ear of a private pilot without an instrument rating. I look forward to each week when the new episode is released, and I try to incorporate what I've learned into my flying. Regards, Michael. And Michael's out of New Jersey. Thanks so much for that. Also heard from Patreon supporter Andrew Carnani. He says, I recently, June 1st, passed my instrument check ride. <laughs> Congratulations to you, Andrew. And I have been trying to learn about the weirder procedures in this part of the country. And he gave me an example that I haven't worked through yet, which included a departure procedure out of Medford, Oregon. I've been to Medford uh, several times and have flown instruments into that, so I'll take a look at that. And now for some updates. Here's something I ran across online from a DPE talking about student pilot certificate applications. He says, after I, in my role as a DPE, approve a student pilot certificate application, it takes about a week for the background check, much longer for non-citizens, before the temporary certificate shows up on IACRA. The temp is good for 120 days, and the plastic card usually arrives in 90 days. On a related note, FAA aircraft registration branch is significantly backed up, a bill of sale is good as a temp registration for, I believe, 90 days. I actually think it's 120. Uh, he says, but Oklahoma City is now taking four months or more to process a registration. Even renewals are taking three or four months, so apply early. Don't let your aircraft registration run out because of bureaucratic inefficiency. And here's an interesting article I ran across this week. This comes from channel1300.com, which I think is up in Madison, Wisconsin. And it's all about a dark arrow, all one word. It says the company launched by the Carl Brothers, three of them, in 2017 after they all quit their corporate jobs and pooled their savings, has grown into a full-service provider of aerospace composites training, classes, and consulting, in addition to manufacturing and selling its signature product, an experimental kit aircraft called the Dark Arrow 1, which is headed into flight testing this summer and already has more than 150 pre-orders from interested customers. I quote, we built the Dark Arrow 1 initially as an airplane for ourselves, but we figured out that other people would probably want it if we did a good job of it, says Carl of the two-person aircraft with a calculated cruising speed of 275 miles per hour and a range of 1,700 miles. So we made it into a company. It says the Carl brothers didn't exactly plan on founding an airplane kit design business together. All three majored in engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Riley Carl, 36, chose aerospace engineering. Keegan Carl, 34, opted for mechanical engineering. River Carl, 32, became an electrical engineer. Between the three of us, we have a nice coverage of different topics that blend well into building an aircraft, Riley Carl says. It wasn't planned, but it worked out really well with that background. It says, as of May, more than 150 customers have put down a deposit. After the prototype passes flight testing this summer and officially comes onto the market, Customers will be able to purchase their own Dark Arrow 1 kit for between $75,000 and $100,000 and build a full airplane for between $150,000 and $200,000. Now, these folks are located up in Wisconsin. Certainly, we wish them well. And I had to sit back and think about other aircraft companies that have been started by brothers. <laughs> you know, Certainly, the most famous one would be the, the Wright brothers. But I was also thinking about a couple uh, brothers who started a company back in 1984, also in Wisconsin, where the Carr brothers are. And they started first as a kit airplane design company, later um, started manufacturing certificated aircraft. And that, of course, was Cirrus and the two uh, Klapmeyer brothers. So, so good luck to this new set of brothers who are also starting in Wisconsin on their new aviation company. And I wanted to share with you my golden rule of aviation. You might want to think about that for a moment. What could that possibly be? 
I've thought about this a number of times, and I practice it just about every time I can. I even shot some video this week, and I'll probably put that out on Instagram at some point. Here's my golden rule of aviation. You have to wave at the kids. Not only is it fun for you, but it's a great way to get the kids enthusiastic about aviation, get them excited, and some of them will come into the industry and join us, either with a career in aviation or as an avocation if they become a pilot. So just remember, the next time you see kids somewhere, make sure you wave at them vigorously and get them excited about aviation. And I'll let you know when I post that uh, video I created. And this week I was doing a checkout of a CFI on our new Diamond DA42 Twin at Palo Alto. If you want to fly that airplane, let me know. And during our oral discussion before we flew, he brought up risk management. And he gave probably the best risk management analysis a pilot has ever given me prior to a flight. And he brought up something I've been telling my clients about that I don't often hear people talk about. And that is that one of the big risks we face in that aircraft, and also with our three Cirrus aircraft, is that they are all parked in probably the tightest parking area on the entire airport property. Then he said that we should exercise extreme caution as we taxied out of the parking area and after the flight as we taxied back into it. And that certainly makes a lot of sense. In the past, I've heard that at our club, fully 50% of insurance claims over the years have been people who have damaged the aircraft, not in the air, but while they were either taxing or while they were pushing it back into a parking space. So definitely think about all the different risks that you face for your next flight, and one of them could be taxing. And separately, one of my clients told me that he got chewed out by ATC last week, and here's what happened. He was flying his airplane into the Napa Airport, which is K-A-P-C, and requested to fly the ILS Runway 1 approach starting at FESAV, that's F-E-S-A-V. He says he forgot to request to fly the course reversal, and Oakland Center reprimanded him for not giving them a heads up that he was going to fly the hold. He says, I had forgotten to activate vectors to final, and the autopilot proceeded to fly one turn on the hold, given the angle I had intersected the final approach course. Oops. So two points really to be made here. First, always be looking at the sequence of waypoints in your flight plan so that you can see what the autopilot is going to do next. In this case, he would have seen a line in the flight plan which said hold, alerting him that the plane would be making a procedure turn, and he could have simply deleted the hold from the flight plan, and the aircraft would have turned directly onto the approach. And if you're ever using the autopilot, and you find the airplane starts to do something you hadn't intended, it's usually faster to just disconnect the autopilot and hand fly the aircraft so that the airplane doesn't turn further off course as you try to fix the autopilot instructions. Or if you're lucky enough to have an autopilot with a level key, the moment you notice the aircraft starting to turn the wrong way or to bust through an altitude, just push the level key. That will instantly stop any turn or any unwanted climb or descent. That way the autopilot doesn't continue to fly you further off course as you fix your flight plan or correct the autopilot modes. And now let's see if you know any of these people who signed up this week to help support the show. Now, we didn't actually have any new supporters, but we did have three people who edited their support up within Patreon, so thanks so much for doing that. We have a new Omega supporter, which is Jacques DeMoss. He edited his pledge up to $50 a month. Thanks so much, Jacques, and I'll be telling you more about Jacques in the future. We also had Jason Mark, who edited his pledge up to $20, so he'll be viewing the videos that I post every week or so. And Michael Baraz edited his pledge up to $35 a month, so he'll also have access to the online training courses that I have on the G1000 and on WAS. Thanks so very much for your support. And if you'd like to join the club and help support this show, it's easy to do. Just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome and sign up at whatever dollar level you'd like to do. Or if you'd like to make a one-time donation, you can go to aviationnewstalk.com slash paypal and use a credit card even if you don't have a PayPal account to make either a one-time donation or a monthly donation. And I want to thank everyone who takes time to help support my work, and I hope more people will join as well, too. Coming up next, we're going to answer a number of listener questions about pop-up requests for IFR and for practice instrument approaches, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. First, my thanks to Patreon supporter Bob Luton for sending in a list of eight questions related to pop-up requests for IFR and practice instrument approaches. His first question is, when and where to ask for a pop-up IFR approach? First, let's talk about what's meant by a pop-up request. Now, oddly, 
the phrase pop-up does not appear anywhere in FAA's major instrument publications for pilots, which are the Instrument Flying Handbook, the Instrument Procedures Handbook, or the AIM, the Aeronautical Information Manual. It does occur just once in the first place I started searching for it, which is the FAA's Controller Handbook, more correctly known as Order JO 7110.65Z. Now I've included a link to the 7110.65 in the show notes in case you're interested in reading through it. That document includes a pilot controller glossary that runs 123 pages, but pop-up is not included in the glossary. So perhaps the FAA defines pop-up elsewhere, but not in any of these four major documents. I searched online for a general definition of pop-up, but none of them were particularly helpful for pilots. So let me try to define it. A pop-up request is one in which a pilot contacts ATC and requests an IFR clearance without first having filed an IFR flight plan. So in essence, ATC has no prior knowledge that you'll be requesting an IFR clearance because you didn't file a flight plan. Now, the vast majority of IFR flight is conducted on pre-filed flight plans. So pop-up requests are a relatively small percentage of the overall IFR traffic. And you might think of it this way. If you're at work doing whatever it is you do for work, you may have a plan for what you're going to be doing for the day. You have a number of tasks to perform, many of which your boss or someone else gave you to do. So you have a plan of how you're going to juggle these tasks to get as many of them done as possible during the day. But then every hour or so, your boss pops in and says, hey, here's another task for you, and I need you to handle it right now, in addition to all of those other things you're doing. Well, each time this happens, you need to adjust your plan for how you're going to be handling this additional work. And if you've been in your job for a long time, you already know that this is how your boss operates. So you're not really surprised when this additional task occurs, because you're used to the fact that this is an expected part of your job. But at the exact moment that it occurred, you didn't have prior knowledge it would occur, so it was unexpected, but not surprising. And that's the nature of a pop-up request. Now, no analogy is perfect, but let's carry this one a bit further. Suppose you're working at 100% of your capacity when you get another request from your boss. There is no way for you to handle this additional task at that exact moment. So you tell your boss, I'm sorry that task will have to wait for a little while because I'm completely maxed out right now. And when controllers are completely maxed out handling all of the pilots who filed IFR flight plans and everyone else who's getting flight following, and you make a pop-up request, they will tell you that they're unable to handle your request at that time. Their response will probably be brief since they're busy. It may be something along the lines of Cessna 1234, unable at this time, maintain VFR. So you need to make sure you stay out of the clouds for the foreseeable future, as you have no idea when or even if you'll be able to get an IFR clearance. Most of the time, though, controllers will give you some idea of when they might be able to accommodate your request. For example, the controller might have said, Cessna 1234, unable at this time, maintain VFR, contact flight service to file a flight plan and call me in 10 minutes. Or the controller might say, Cessna 1234, unable at this time, maintain VFR. I'll call you back in five minutes. So Bob asked when and where to ask for a pop-up IFR clearance. The when would be at the earliest possible time that you anticipate you won't be able to complete your flight VFR. Look at it this way. You probably didn't file an IFR flight plan because you thought you could complete the flight VFR. But the weather changed, and you now anticipate that you'll need an IFR clearance. And there may be dozens of other aircraft in the sky in that same situation at that moment. If they all wait until the last minute, when they're absolutely sure that they need an IFR clearance because they're about to fly into a cloud, some of those pilots are going to have to wait because ATC may start to become overloaded when lots of pilots start making pop-up requests around the same time. In general, there's some slack in ATC's capability, which means the controllers are usually not maxed out at 100% capacity except for brief periods of time. So they can often handle one or two pop-up requests. But if it's Sunday evening and dozens of aircraft are flying home from the weekend and they're all headed for the LA Basin at the same time, SoCal Approach may not have the capacity to handle all those pop-up requests at one time. So a savvy pilot will make their pop-up request early at the first sign that they may need a pop-up clearance rather than wait until the last minute when lots of other aircraft are reaching the same conclusion at the same time that they all need pop-up clearances to get to their destination. Bob also asked where you would make a pop-up request. I would do it on the least busy frequency 
on my way to my destination, as they're the most likely to be able to handle my requests. I would also do it very soon after I came onto that quiet frequency, because if I wait 10 minutes to make that request, ATC may be just about to switch me to the next frequency and will probably say, make that request with the next controller. And if the next controller is maxed out, well, you just missed a really good opportunity to make your pop-up request and get into the IFR system. So for example, as I fly back to my home airport of Palo Alto from the north or the east, I know that the last NorCal frequency before I get switched to tower is 125.35. However, most days this frequency also handles arrivals to the Oakland airport, and at times they are exceptionally busy and barely have time to talk with me, even if I'm already in the system and have been handed off to them from another sector. On a few occasions, they've been so busy I haven't even tried to check in with them. Instead, I'll just wait, and eventually they'll call me when they finally have a spare moment. And you can bet in situations like that, they are happy I didn't clog up the frequency by trying to check in with them immediately. Since I know that 125.35 is often very busy, I usually try to request flight following or a pop-up IFR clearance when I'm in the prior sector near Stockton, California on 125.1. Now Bob's next question is where to find the frequency for ATC, assuming you are not already talking to ATC. Well, Bob, if you're near a metro area, especially one with a Class B or Class C airspace, you want to find the frequency for an approach controller. Or if you're far from a metro area or are really high, perhaps above 12,000 feet, you'll want to find the frequency for a center controller. Ideally, you'd like to get the correct frequency on your first try, but don't worry if you don't. Because once you establish contact with ATC, if you're not on the correct frequency, they'll most likely determine where you are and then switch you to the correct frequency. Now, in the bad old days, we had to find these frequencies by looking at either a sectional chart or an IFR low altitude in route chart. These days, with modern GPS navigators and with EFBs such as ForeFlight and Garmin Pilot, it's much easier to find the correct frequency on the first try. Let's talk about finding frequencies in the Garmin navigator such as the Garmin 430-530, the GTN 650-750, and with integrated flight decks such as the Garmin G1000 Perspective and Perspective Plus, G3000, and G5000. And by the way, there is an excellent book available on the G1000 and Perspective, and another great book on the G3000 and G5000. And in those books, I talk about where to find the nearest approach and center frequencies. And interestingly, the method you use is different depending upon whether you want an approach frequency versus the center frequency. So if you're flying the G1000 or the G3000 or G5000 and you don't know exactly how to find the nearest approach or center frequency, well, think of all the many other things that you could learn from my books. I think of these flight decks as being similar to Microsoft Word. Most of us understand and use just 5% of its capabilities, yet there's a whole wealth of features available if we take the time to learn them. So if you fly G1000 or Perspective or G3000 or G5000 and you want to become an expert, Take a moment now, pick up the phone, and order my Max Truscott's G1000 and Perspective Glass Cockpit Handbook, or my G3000 and G5000 Glass Cockpit Handbook, and you can order them by calling 800-247-6553, or go online to maxtruscott.com. Or you can also get one of my books by signing up to become a Patreon supporter at the $50 a month level for at least two months. And you can do that by going to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. To find the nearest center frequency in the Garmin Navigator, Go to the nearest group and scroll down to find the nearest frequencies page. Then look for ARTCC, which stands for Air Route Traffic Control Center, which is what pilots call center. Under ARTCC or ARTC, you'll find the five nearest center frequencies. Usually the first one on the list is the frequency you'll want to use. In most Garmin navigators, it also shows you the direction to the center transmitter. If the first frequency is a long way behind you, and the second frequency listed is a similar distance in front of you, then you should start with the second frequency since that's the one you're flying toward and the transmitter that will be getting stronger as you fly. Finding the nearest approach frequency is a little more difficult. You first need to find the nearest airport to you at that moment in flight. Then go to the waypoint group. The first page in that group is the airport waypoint page. Then enter the identifier for the nearest airport. Then under the info or info one soft key or tab, you want to look through the frequencies shown for that airport. Look for either a frequency labeled Approach or Departure. Then call ATC on one of those frequencies to see if you can reach them. If you can't, and there are two frequencies, try the other frequency. If you don't have a GPS navigator in the plane, 
then you can use an EFB app such as ForeFlight or Garmin Pilot. Find the airport closest to you and then go to the AFD or Airport Facility Directory page for that airport. Somewhere on the AFD page, you should see frequencies listed for approach and or center. Also, you can always contact Flight Service and ask them for the appropriate center or approach frequency for your area. The universal frequency for Flight Service is 122.2, or you can look on a sectional map and find the VOR closest to you. Look for the box with the VOR information. Just above that box, you'll find the nearest Flight Service frequency. Bob then asked, what information should your initial call include? Well, Bob, if you're requesting flight following, at a minimum, you should mention the airport you're going to, your aircraft type, and your altitude. If you're requesting an IFR clearance, then you also need to tell ATC that you need an IFR clearance. And I would include the words IFR clearance in your first transmission, the one in which you give your destination aircraft type and altitude. And the reason that's important is that in some areas, different squawk code prefixes are used for VFR versus IFR aircraft. So for example, here in the area served by NorCal Approach, VFR squawk codes often start with 03 or 53, so you might be issued a squawk code of 0377 or 5377 if you're VFR. By contrast, if you're IFR, you might be issued a squawk code starting with 42 or 45, such as 4277 or 4577. So if you make an IFR pop-up request, you definitely want to let ATC know on your first transmission that you need an IFR clearance. Otherwise, they may issue a VFR squawk code. If you don't mention in the first transmission that you need an IFR clearance, and they give you a squawk code, and then immediately after getting that code, you mention you need an IFR clearance, you may be creating extra work for ATC to issue a second transponder code. Bob then asks, what if you also want to practice the MAP? And I think by that he means the missed approach procedure. My answer is the same regardless of whether you're under VFR or IFR. And that is when you talk with the final approach controller, that's the one who issues you your clearance for the approach, that controller will almost always ask you, how will the approach terminate? And typical answers you might give them include one, full stop landing, or two, circle to land, runway three, three, or whatever runway you plan to circle to, or three, we'll fly the published missed approach, or four, we'll fly the alternate missed approach. If the controller doesn't ask how will the approach terminate, then the controller possibly forgot to ask, or he may have assumed correctly or incorrectly that you plan to land on the straight in runway and make a full stop landing. If that isn't the case, for example, you plan to circle or fly the published missed approach, then you should let the approach controller know of your plans before you're switched to the tower or the local CTAF frequency. It's particularly important for the controller to know if you're planning to fly the missed approach, as if you don't tell the controller, they won't be able to work in advance to protect you from other traffic along the missed approach segment. <laughs> Controllers hate surprises, and you don't want to surprise the controller by suddenly showing up on the missed approach when they thought you were going to land. That's especially true on instrument approaches where the missed approach flies back along or close to the inbound approach that you just flew to the airport. Because if the controller has a second aircraft following behind you on the instrument approach, there could be a serious conflict if you start to fly the missed approach, and now you're head-to-head -head with the second aircraft flying the instrument approach. Bob then asks, what if you only want to practice instrument approach and are not current IFR? Now, by practice approach, I assume you mean an instrument approach flown under VFR flight rules. Obviously, a pilot who is not instrument current is not permitted to file and fly IFR. But any pilot can fly a practice approach under VFR conditions. To do that, if you're getting a VFR flight following or you're making an initial call to get VFR flight following, tell ATC that you want a VFR practice approach. Now, here's one minor little gotcha. The term practice approach doesn't appear in the instrument flying handbook or the instrument procedures handbook. It's used multiple times in the AIM and the controller handbook, but it's not defined in any of these documents. And pilots and controllers sometimes have a slightly different understanding of what it means. To a pilot, a practice approach usually means an instrument approach flown under VFR conditions. And that approach might be to a full stop landing, or you might fly the published missed approach. But to controllers, in some situations, a practice approach means that you won't be landing, but that you'll be flying the published missed approach. For example, there's a letter of agreement between NorCal Approach and the Monterey Tower that says that the RNAV GPS Yankee 28 left can't be flown as a practice approach. And most likely that's for noise abatement reasons. So even when I'm IFR, 
NorCal won't give me the approach if I plan to fly the mist, as they view it as a practice approach. But they will give me the approach if I plan to land, because that's not viewed as a practice approach. Let me throw out one other thing about VFR practice instrument approaches. It's not a great idea to fly a VFR practice instrument approach by yourself, especially in a busy area, because it's hard as a single pilot to both scan the instruments and fly an instrument approach while scanning for outside traffic. And for sure, as a single pilot, you're not going to wear a hood to simulate instrument flight. You're only allowed to do that if you're flying with a flight instructor or a safety pilot who's ready to fly the aircraft you're in. However, if you're by yourself and you use the autopilot for a VFR practice approach, that's a reasonably safe thing to do, as you can then spend most of your time looking outside for traffic. As part of the practice approach question, Bob also asked, what if you want an IFR clearance for the approach? Do you have to be instrument rated in IFR current? The answer is simple. To get an IFR clearance, you must be instrument rated and you must be instrument current. If you're not instrument rated in instrument current, you can't legally operate IFR and you can't get any kind of an IFR clearance. Bob also asked, what should you expect ATC approach approval to sound like? Uh, cleared for the approach or approach approved? I haven't heard approach approved lately. Is it obsolete? Or will ATC say maintain VFR if your clearance is not an IFR clearance? Unfortunately, Bob, that is one answer I can quote directly from the controller handbook as they provided a specific example. In section 4-8-11 item 3, it says, where separation services are not provided to VFR aircraft practicing instrument approaches, the controller must A, instruct the pilot to maintain VFR, B, advise the pilot that separation services are not provided, and then they give an example of what a controller might say, and this is under the heading phraseology. And it says aircraft identification, but I'll just go ahead and say it as a Cessna. It says Cessna 1234 maintain VFR, practice approach approved, no separation services provided. Now Bob also asks, assuming you are a VFR approaching an uncontrolled airport, what should your Unicom announcement on the approach sound like? Well, that's a great question, and it's one I talk a lot about with my clients. First, anything you say in the CTAF frequency should be understandable to both VFR and instrument pilots. So for example, if you say Cessna 1234 inbound on the VOR Alpha approach, most private pilots and certainly all student pilots would have little clue as to where you are now, where you are going, and where they may come into potential conflict with you as you approach the airport. So my first rule is communicate in a way so both instrument and non-instrument rated pilots can understand what you're saying. My second rule is that you not only communicate your present position to all pilots clearly, but that you also communicate what you'll be doing next. So for example, announcing I'm seven miles out on the VOR Alpha approach is not only meaningless to non-instrument pilots, it doesn't tell any pilot whether or not you're going to land or which runway you intend to use. So let me use the VOR Alpha approach into Watsonville, California, the identifier is KWVI as an example. That approach comes in on a final approach course of about 315 degrees, which is more than 30 degrees off from all four runways. In my initial call, I would say something like Watsonville traffic, Cirrus 977, Juliet Whiskey, 10 miles to the southeast on the VOR Alpha approach. We'll be entering on the 45 and making left traffic to runway 20, Watsonville traffic. Now that gives both instrument and non-instrument rated pilots a very clear idea of where I am now and what they can expect me to do next. And if I didn't plan to land, but plan to fly the published missed approach, I might say instead, Watsonville traffic, Cirrus 977, Juliet Whiskey, 10 miles to the southeast on the VOR Alpha approach. We'll be crossing overhead the airport at 1300 feet and then making a climbing left turn back to the southeast, Watsonville traffic. Most instrument pilots would understand that to mean that I'll be flying the published missed approach but I've done it in a way that all non-instrument pilots have a clear idea of what I'll be doing after I reach the airport. And here's one thing to watch out for at non-towered airports, regardless of whether you're a VFR pilot approaching the airport or if you're on an instrument approach. I sometimes hear pilots announce their present position and what they intend to do, but sometimes they do it in a way that makes it unclear as to what their position is right now. So they might say they're west of the airport, right downwind 3-4, and that's unclear as to whether they're currently on the right downwind now or whether that's where they plan to be in a few minutes. To make it clearer, I'd say we're five miles west of the airport and we'll be crossing overhead the field to enter on the 45 for right traffic runway 34. 
That makes it clear where we are now and what we'll be doing later. And finally, Bob asks, under what conditions, if any, can you legally log the instrument approach in actual instrument time? And I think he means under a VFR practice approach. You can find the answer to this question in the FAA's Info 15012. That's an information for operators note, and I'll include a link to it in the show notes. If it's a VFR practice approach, then you're not allowed to go through a cloud, and so you can't log any actual instrument time. If it's a VFR practice approach and you're by yourself, you also can't log the approach, much less any IMC time. You can't log the approach because you weren't under the hood and shouldn't be under the hood unless you have a safety pilot or a CFI on board with you. If it's a VFR practice approach and you do have a safety pilot or a CFI on board, you can log the approach as long as you flew with a view limiting device up until the point where you reach the minimums for the approach. Things are different, of course, if you're flying under an IFR flight plan. If you're IFR and by yourself and you never pass through a cloud, you cannot log the instrument approach and you can't log any actual instrument time. By contrast, if you never fly through a cloud but have a safety pilot on board as you fly IFR and you're wearing a view limiting device, you can log an approach provided you fly to minimums under the hood, but you won't log any actual instrument time as you never pass through a cloud. Or if you're IFR, and you fly through the clouds on the approach, you can log any time you spend in the clouds as actual instrument time. And you can log the approach for instrument currency purposes, provided you are still in the clouds at the final approach fix and break out of the cloud sometimes after you pass the FAF and are on the final segment of the approach. Bob, great set of questions. Thanks so much for sending those along. And thanks for being a Patreon supporter for nearly four years. I greatly appreciate your support and for your emailed questions. Coming up next, more of your emails and questions, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And here's an email from new patron supporter Robin Stanley. He says, Good day, Max. Robin from Australia, longtime GA pilot, currently owning two Cirrus SR22s. One should hopefully be sold soon. Thanks for your podcast. I got my student license on my 16th birthday back in 1978. Also did the private commercial and have single engine and multi engine command instrument ratings. I still learned something from every one of your podcasts. It was really easy to sign up to support the show on Patreon, and I'm happy to do it for something that could save my life. Well, thanks, Robin. That's very kind of you. And here's a message that just came in a day or so ago on Facebook Messenger from Julian Turchak. He says, Hi, Max. Just heard you read out Robin Stanley's name, which I just mentioned again, on episode 236. He is one of my co-owners in the 2017 SR22 G6 we bought last year. Great how word of mouth works to expand your listener base. Cheers, Julian. Well, that's great. So we've got two partners listening to the show. And here's a message from Patreon supporter Joshua McElhatton. He says, Max, I got my PPL six months ago, and I'm now working on my instrument rating in a Cirrus SR22 near Pittsburgh. Your podcast has helped me several times, and I thought at time I start recognizing it. Thank you. I had an interesting scenario happen last month when ATC asked me to look out for a plane nearby squawking emergency. I ended up being able to reach out to them on a local CTAF frequency and watch them land safely, relaying that info to ATC. As a fairly new pilot, I had adrenaline rushing during this. I wondered if you had any advice on situations like this. I'm sure I could have done some things better. I happen to have my cameras running, so if you're interested, you can watch it on YouTube. My thanks and best regards, Josh. And I did take a look at Josh's video on YouTube. I'll include a link to it in the show notes for others who might want to take a look at it. It runs about four and a half minutes, and I thought he did an excellent job. Essentially, it was an aircraft that ATC saw squawking 7700, but they could not reach them on any of their frequencies. So they asked uh, Joshua to try uh, reaching the aircraft on CTAF, which he did. The aircraft was on base at that point to land. And when I replied to Josh, I asked if he knew what happened to the aircraft. And he wrote back, I actually did find out what happened to the other aircraft through some people who saw the video. During upset recovery training, apparently the plane lost all oil pressure while inverted. I don't know whether the engine stopped producing full power or not during their return. So thanks so much for sharing that, Joshua. And here's an email from patron supporter Chris Lindsay. Chris says, I really enjoyed your discussion with Seth Lake in episode 234 about cost sharing. I'm wondering if you can clarify a small question. The FAR has always used the terminology compensation or higher, but I haven't been able to find any distinction between compensation or higher. 
Are these just two sides of the same coin, or are there real operational or transactional differences between a flight for compensation and a flight for hire? And I wrote back to Chris and I said, thanks for your message. I found a definition for compensation here in Advisory Circular AC61-142. It says in the definition section, compensation, receipt of anything of value that is contingent upon the pilot acting as pilot in command, PIC, of an aircraft. Now, the word hire isn't defined. However, in the definition section, hire is used in the definition for both commercial operator and common carriage. So from this, I would infer that one, compensation refers to the act of a pilot getting paid to fly an airplane. For example, I could get paid to fly a Part 91 owner or be a corporate pilot. In both cases, it wouldn't be a for hire operation, since in most cases, neither situation would involve carrying the general public. Two, for hire seems to involve a common carrier or any other operation that involves carrying the general public from point A to point B for a fee. However, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't claim to have any insight other than what I inferred from reading AC61-42. I hope that helps, and thanks for supporting the show. And here's an email from mega supporter Dan Morris. He says, I have an IFR question since my check ride is in a couple weeks. If you lose COM and are following the MEA slash AVEF part of AIM 6-4-13, your clearance limit is the arrival airport, and your AF route involves a fix from once an approach begins, are you expected to fly over the airport before you start an approach? 6-4-13C says that if your clearance limit isn't an IAF, then you proceed to your limit, the airport, and start an approach from there. The DPE I have recently told a CFII candidate that you go to the airport, but all of my instructors said that wasn't accurate as they were preparing me for my check ride. I just want to make sure I'm accurate. Lastly, if this is the case, would you just file an IFR flight plan to an approach fix so that it becomes your limit? Seems like it wouldn't be the correct path because weather can change best runways. And I wrote back, Dan, you raise a really good question. And I think there's a reason you may hear DPEs and CFIs give different answers. I believe the DPE is technically correct as that's what it says in 6-4-1C3C. So as odd as it sounds, yes, you would fly to the airport first. However, if you talk with most any controller, they'd probably wonder what the heck is he doing as they watch you fly past an IAF, fly to the airport, reverse course, and fly back out to the IAF. From a practical standpoint, most controllers want to get a Nordo aircraft out of the system as quickly and safely as possible. So from a practical standpoint, I don't think ATC would have an issue if you flew directly to your preferred IAF without first flying to the airport. However, if anything happened and the FAA investigated afterwards, an inspector could theoretically violate you for not first flying to the airport and then to the IAF. I think CFI has realized that flying directly to the IAF and not flying first to the airport is more practical, and that's probably why you hear that response from them. And yes, I have filed to a fix before, but never for this particular reason. On a couple of occasions, I've wanted people to get IFR practice at the beginning of a long mountain checkout flight. So we departed IFR and remained IFR to a particular fix. Then we continued on VFR to land at multiple airports in the mountains. Dan, I hope that helps. Thanks for your message. And Patreon supporter Foster Doss said regarding episode 235 with Alan Brown, what an awesome interview. And I heard that from a couple different people. Alan Brown, of course, was the chief designer for the F-117 stealth fighter friend of mine. And of course, we're sorry to see him pass. And I'm working here for answers on a couple of other emails. I had a question from patron supporter Nick, who's a fisherman up in Sitka, Alaska, about flying the LDA into Juneau, Alaska. Coincidentally, I may be up there myself in a couple of weeks. So I still need to do a little bit more research on that. And also I had a message from patron supporter Milo Tour, who was asking about the equipment that I use when I am shooting a video in the aircraft. So we'll get to that sometime in the future as well. And if you'd like to send me an email, the easiest way to get to me is just go out to aviationnewstalk.com, click on contact at the top of the page, fill out the form, and that'll come directly to me. And I want to thank all of you for your contributions in whatever way you help support the show. And if you would, take a moment today to please tell a friend about the show. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up.